Okay, friends, I am here back once again to talk about Hans Urs von Balthasar. He is the second major theologian in this dual lesson or complementary lesson uh, concerning theological or apologetical approaches. The first lesson, the first approach we looked at was Karl Rahner, and that's often referred to as the approach from below. And hopefully uh, from the readings and from the two lectures that I provided, there is now some understanding uh, in you for what that approach looks like, where you begin with man and try on the categories and uh, the experience of the human being concretely as he is, learn something about God. Uh, you learn something about God by looking at the conditions for the possibility of his self-communication to man. Uh, so hopefully that makes some sense. And now we're going to look at what is often thought to be a very different approach. Some would say an opposite approach. Others might say a complementary approach. Uh, this is the approach from above as opposed to from below. And in Catholic theology, this approach is often identified with the theology of someone like Hans Urs von Balthasar. So Karl Rahner and Hans Urs von Balthasar are two of the most famous Catholic theologians in the 20th century, and arguably they're sort of the most influential theologians, and they are often uh, you know, seen in some kind of tension with each other. And it, uh, a lot has to do with their basic approach to theology and to revealing the credibility or intrinsic intelligibility of Christian faith. Okay, Hans Urs von Balthasar is a, a Swiss. He was a Jesuit for a while. Uh, but before I tell that story, uh, I should actually go to my first bullet point, which concerns the fact that he was a talented pianist. Uh, he was a very talented musician growing up. Uh, there's reason to think that he could have had a career in it if he wanted. Uh, he also, in his education, didn't study theology formally. Uh, he studied sort of humanities in, in, uh, of the German language. So literature, poetry, theology, philosophy as well, but it was a much more humanistic uh, studies. So I think you could consider him in a broad sense, sort of like a UD man. He was somebody who was totally immersed in the great books and who didn't stay confined to his one particular discipline. He read well outside of his discipline. He took a core curriculum, as it were. And so the conversation that he was involved in was one that was very much interdisciplinary uh, and involved a lot of different um, kinds of literature. De Lubach, Henri de Lubach, a, a very famous Jesuit theologian whom we've seen already, uh, referred to him as the most cultured man in Europe. Uh, his erudition and the knowledge that he had of the tradition uh, it was astounding. And uh, I think anybody who reads his works senses that immediately. Of course, one can always say, was he the best interpreter of that tradition? And that's a fair question for people to, to raise critically. But I think anybody who reads it, uh, his work, uh, undeniably has the impression that this man knew a lot. And uh, that's, that's something that could be very cool because if you also have a large culture, then you can see how theological ideas can really tie into the whole world of things. But if you're like me and you're still very much a baby in the tradition, then it can sometimes be an obstacle because you'll be reading his works and you'll not have a strong sense for what he's talking about because there are just so many different names, so many different currents mentioned. I think in the book that uh, we're reading for this class, Love Alone is Credible, if you read chapters one and two, you might have that impression that this is a very difficult author because he just knows way too darn much and it's hard to keep up with him. Uh, keep in mind also that this book is a condensation uh, of a larger 16 volume work. Uh, and I'll say something about that in a few minutes, but it's, uh, it's not something to be discouraged by. Uh, it's ultimately a great merit of his, but it's certainly a, a difficulty. Uh, he was, again, a Swiss Jesuit, and uh, this is important to know only because he uh, stopped being a Jesuit at some point. So he wanted to start a new form of, of ecclesial life and ministry that mixed lay and clergy. 
and he wanted uh, to do that initially as a Jesuit, but the Jesuit order at the time said, this is a project that we can't really embrace. If you want to do this, you know, go in peace, but, but go. Uh, and so he didn't make his, his, um, his, his sort of final definitive vows as a Jesuit. Uh, and he, you know, was dispensed, left in good peace, and founded something called the Johannes Gemeinschaft. And he did that with the help of a woman who was a convert to Catholic faith named Adrienne von Speyer. And she is very important uh, to know about uh, for understanding Balthazar. Uh, she appears to have been a mystic, a very devout and, and intense, uh, intense woman of the spirit. And she has had visions and all sorts of spiritual experiences that Balthazar took very seriously. And uh, by his own words, you know, saw his theological project largely as the exposition of her spiritual experience. So some people look at that as a very positive thing, namely that Balthazar's theology is directly rooted in the spiritual life. One might say, well, it's the spiritual life of someone else. And so maybe that's not exactly as good as we would want. But uh, nevertheless, that is a very positive thing that he is connecting his theology to or the, the Christian faith concretely lived. Negatively, one can wonder whether or not that leaves Balthazar's theology a little bit esoteric. So uh, is this something that can really be embraced by the church universal if it depends so heavily on the particular experiences of a woman? And does it, is it all hanging upon the truth or not of, of her spiritual life? Was it authentic or not? And does the Balthazar's theology rise or fall with that judgment? Uh, so I think uh, some critics, understandably, have, have a problem with his theology in that regard, especially when some of the experiences or some of the, the visions or judgments that she and Balthazar arrive at seem to be uh, uh, very controversial or challenging of the tradition. So he has some statements about Holy Saturday and the descent of the sun into hell that have roiled a lot of uh, theologians and initiate a lot of controversy. But anyway, we won't get into that. I just you know, want you to know that that's out there as we, as we study Balthazar. Uh, he wrote over 100 books, so he was extremely prolific. However, he never taught as a professor, and that's, I think, very interesting. So he uh, obviously is a very articulate person, uh, obviously was very erudite, but he perhaps uh, never had, or at least to the same degree as a professor would, that challenge of making himself understood by a classroom of people. So perhaps uh, that is something that uh, marked his particular style. It might also explain how he could be so prolific. I mean, 100 books is a lot of books. Uh, he's a major figure in the Comunio school as opposed to the Concilium school. And so he is part of the, the same tribe of folk like Henri de Lubac and, and Joseph Ratzinger. And again, he's often juxtaposed to Karl Rahner. Down here is a picture of Adrian von Speyer. And here is a picture of Balthazar uh, with uh, JP2. Uh, JP2, as we'll see in a moment, named him to the cardinalate and uh, had a high esteem for Balthazar's work, as did uh, Joseph Ratzinger. While Balthazar was named to the cardinalate, he did not live long enough to receive it. So he died shortly before uh, receiving the, the title. In a homily at his funeral, however, Joseph Ratzinger then uh, soon to become Pope Benedict XVI, uh, made a very strong statement uh, endorsing his theology. Now, this too is something that can certainly be debated. What is the nature of this endorsement? How, to what extent and exactly what did Ratzinger prize in Balthazar? Was it every controversial thesis? No, probably not. Uh, but there was a certain general thrust, as we'll see in a moment, to Balthazar's theology that Ratzinger definitely approved of. So he says in the homily, uh, that by this honor, we, we know that no longer only private individuals, but the church itself and its official responsibility tells us that he, Balthazar, is right in what he teaches of the faith, that he points the way to the sources of living water, a witness to the word which teaches us Christ and which teaches us how to live. So a very strong endorsement. And we can ask ourselves, what in particular does Ratzinger like? Well, something of that I hope you gather from the article from Ratzinger that you read about uh, beauty as a theological path. He mentions Balthazar specifically and what he really admires about Balthazar. So here's a quotation from that article. 
uh, just after waxing on about how important beauty is and uh, being struck by beauty to theology, he says that, of course, we must not underestimate the importance of theological reflection, of exact and careful theological thought. It is still absolutely necessary. So for all this talk about art, aesthetics, beauty, rapture, things like that, uh, Ratzinger, uh, and I'm sure this is no surprise to you, is certainly not saying we don't need to be systematic, we don't need to have vocabulary, we don't need to think logically, and so forth. Uh, he says, but to despise on that account, namely the importance of systemic, uh, systematic thought, to despise on the, just because systematic thought is important, the impact produced by the heart's encounter with beauty or to reject it as a true form of knowledge would impoverish us and dry up both faith and theology. We must rediscover this form of knowledge. It is an urgent demand of the present hour. So Ratzinger here is saying that yes, logical systematic thought is very important, but if you privilege that in a way that despises or ignores the importance of beauty, of letting the heart fall in love, of being it caught, raptured by something, uh, then we're making a huge mistake that will impoverish uh, faith in theology. So we've, we've got to rediscover beauty as a form of knowledge, be the beautiful as a genuine encounter with the real. Uh, taking this insight, Ratzinger continues, as his point of departure, namely the, the importance of beauty, Hansers von Balthasar built his magnum opus of theological aesthetics. Many details of it have entered into current theological scholarship, although the, his fundamental approach, which is actually the essential element of the whole work, has not been widely accepted. Of course, this is not only and not even principally a problem for theology, rather it is also a problem for pastoral ministry, which must arrange for people to encounter the beauty of the faith. I would say it's also a problem, for not just for theology and pastoral mystery, but also apologetics. And I think Ratzinger would totally agree with that. He might, probably would say, of course, Father John, that's part of what I mean by pastoral ministry. In any event, this is very relevant to our course and to determining the fundamental approach by which you would do apologetics, by which you would go out and try to persuade people of the credibility of Christian faith. Taking seriously the heart's encounter with beauty and the role that, shape, that, the role that has on what we know uh, we'll talk about the magnum opus in a moment, um, but Ratzinger here is saying that Hans Urs von Balthasar built his magnum opus, his theological aesthetics, with this insight at the heart of it, namely the importance of the encounter with beauty. And he's saying that while, you know, people have embraced one or another theses of Balthasar uh, here or there in his writings, uh, and I think a lot of the controversy concerns some of those theses, the, the fundamental approach of taking seriously the heart's encounter with beauty is unfortunately something that Ratzinger said has not been adopted, uh, at least not as widespread as it ought to be. And uh, so whatever else one thinks of Balthazar, I hope that uh, he feels challenged by Ratzinger here to, uh, to be open to, to this way of beauty. Okay, another quotation here to sort of uh, stick with Ratzinger for a moment, but to say something else uh, concrete about the beauty as a way of approaching the Christian mystery. So Ratzinger says, looking at icons and in general at the great masterpieces of Christian art leads us on an interior way, a way of transcendence, and thus brings us in the purification of sight that is a purification of the heart face to face with beauty, or at least with a ray of it. I hope that you've had that experience in your own life of encountering a piece of music, a person, a work of art, a movie, a saint's life, something that you found beautiful and therefore submitted to in a certain way. By recognizing its beauty, you allow it a certain authority. I think, at least in my own experience, in recognizing the beautiful, there's this acknowledgement of a kind of distance that I'm, I'm not that, and I value that so highly, and I want to measure in the future by that as a new standard. And so there's something purifying. There, the, the beautiful kind of commands a certain interior change, a conversion of sorts. You recognize it as something above and beyond, as transcendent, something that you submit to. This experience is, is sort of uh, essential to the form of encountering the Christian mystery. Anyway, continue with Ratzinger. Uh, 
In this way, it brings us into contact with the power of the truth. I have often said that I am convinced that the true apologetics for the Christian message, their most persuasive proof of its truth, offsetting everything that may appear negative, are the saints on the one hand, and the beauty that the faith has generated on the other. For faith to grow today, we must lead ourselves and the persons we meet to encounter the saints and to come in contact with the beautiful. So we have a lot of smart things to say in theology, in catechesis, and it's extremely important that we say them and say them well. But Ratzinger is saying that the most persuasive proof of its truth is not that syllogism as much as that syllogism better follow for those who need it and it better follow coherently but the most persuasive proof of its truth certainly the one that's most liable to reach the the, the whole world is for ratzinger beauty under two forms the beauty of the saints so the holiness god's transformation of his people the new heart the life of christ in us showing that to people that is what makes the risen Lord credible. And the beautiful art, the, the human civilization, that is the fruit of that holiness. So the saints, holy people, and their works in the world of culture. I think that, I mean, if you just think about the attraction of someone like Mother Teresa, and I mean that word very strongly, the attraction, that is the recognition of her beauty of Mother Teresa for the whole world, I think this point is, is demonstrated uh, very, very clearly. It, it's very difficult to find somebody who does not admire her, admire. Somebody who doesn't look up to her, look up. Who, somebody who doesn't say, ah, yes, I should measure myself by that. You are tr higher than me. I wish to submit, look up, admire. These are significant words that we use to describe somebody like Mother Teresa. And uh, I think that what she calling what she does is beautiful is probably the the first thing that comes to people's mind now i also think it's true that what she did i, I could say that mother Teresa did the truth and uh i i could defend that i think you know pretty, pretty clearly but i if i want to draw someone into the faith i i don't think the first thing i would say is gosh isn't that true you know i would say gosh isn't that beautiful and the heart is purified by, by saying, yeah, I do love her. I, 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 I am attracted to her. And by, by, by getting caught, purified heart, now once you're within that movement, once you have found this new value, uh, and once you have acknowledged that it's other than you and that it commands a certain purification of you, then within that you can, you can uh, discover also its, its truth and its goodness and so forth. Okay. Uh, backing up now, so that's enough of Ratzinger on Balthazar. Uh, trying to get at this particular approach from above, the way of beauty, now uh, with a different historical context. So Balthazar is a Catholic, but he's uh, informed in a significant degree by what's happened in Protestant theology with Karl Barth in particular. Now, this is a historical lesson that would take us uh, too long and too far afield. But in short form, Karl Barth was a theologian who was very, very disturbed by what he thought was the from below approach of uh, liberal Protestantism in particular, but then also he thought in Catholic theology with its focus on philosophy and the analogy of being. So Barth saw liberal Protestantism, which is basically the Protestantism of Schleiermacher, of Bultmann, of the historical critical method, namely uh, of Kant also, namely this uh, trend in Protestant theology to measure Christianity by the categories of human sciences, whether it be scriptural studies or philosophy uh, or, or whatever. And so the truth of revelation was being filtered through human categories, the categories of the, of the university. And uh, that was the approach from below that Barth thought was disastrous. He said, no, 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 God actually has something new to tell us. We don't tell God what he's telling us. God tells us what he's telling us, you know? And so all these attempts on the part of man to use his own tools, his own categories, his own methods to, to receive that revelation uh, is just uh, uh, so many ways of constructing idols uh, to our own human constructions.
and that the most important thing uh, is to set aside all of the human and receive the word, let it interpret itself. And uh, that is the basic approach of BART. And we'll say something about the, the truth and the falsity, or at least the pro and the con, or, or the yes, but oh, maybe qualified no of that approach in a moment. But I want to extend that now to his critique of Catholicism. So he doesn't like liberal Protestantism, but he also doesn't like Catholic theology because he saw Catholic theology with its focus on philosophy. Uh, with its focus in particular on the thesis of the analogy of being, the analogia entis, as being uh, disastrous. Uh, the analogia entis, or the analogy of being, is this idea that human language, or the language that we derive from naming, experiencing, and knowing creatures, can be applied in some way to God. You may remember from the beginning of the course, we discussed the via negativa, uh, or excuse me, first the via affirmativa, then the via negativa, and then the supereminent way. And so the positive way of naming, the negative way of naming, and the supereminent way of naming God. Positive way, the way in which that whole structure of naming uh, begins, is saying, ah, yeah, creation is good. The apple is good. The creator must be good. The creator of the good apple must himself be good. So I, I say that's a good apple and that's a good creator because he made the good apple. So knowing something about the world uh, it gives me a word, a name, an adjective, good. And then I can use that to, to speak of the creator. And then we spoke about how, okay, well, maybe some sense, yes, but immediately we have to qualify that with a negative way because God's not an apple. And so when I say that the apple is good, I mean like juicy, delicious, healthy. And God's not juicy, delicious, healthy, or at least not in the same way that an apple is. So while I want to say, yeah, there's some truth to that, I also have to say there's some not truth to that. There's some untruth to that. So I have to acknowledge that there's this negative way of applying names to God. And then Aquinas expressing the Catholic tradition says, nevertheless, there is some kind of supereminent way that goes beyond the negative and uh, retains a purified form of the positive, such that at the end of the day, we can say that it is possible to speak about God from creation and that human language can say something, however much we have to qualify it in light of the transcendence of God. Bart, and it's not clear if you really understood what the Catholic Church was saying, the Catholic tradition was saying about the analogy of being, rejected the analogy of being. In fact, here's this very famous quote, I regard the analogia entis, or the analogy of being, as the invention of the Antichrist. And I believe that because of it, it is impossible ever to become a Roman Catholic, all other reasons for not doing so being, to my mind, short-sighted and trivial. So this, uh, those are fighting words, to be sure. And uh, one could say it all hangs on what he understood to be the analogia entis. If he thought that Catholics say that the analogy of being means that, yeah, uh, God is no different than any other creature. And when I say he's good, he's beautiful, he's true, he's, he's, he's awesome, he's powerful, I mean that just like a, a tiger is powerful or a, or a steak dinner is good and all those other things, then yeah, that would be a huge problem because uh, we would have totally lost sight of the mystery of God and we have been wrapped up in our own imminence and thinking about God as a creature. And, and we would have at that point constructed an idol. And it does seem to me not an exaggeration to say that that is the work of the devil or the antichrist to, to look for God in the exclusive of the human. That seems disastrous. However, I don't think that's what the Catholic uh, church has been saying. And, uh, and if, if Bart meant to, to reject this other way, uh, then he has his own huge problem. And we'll say that in a moment. So taking a look here, we'll say it right now is what I mean. So the, the approach from below over here, what exactly is that in the Catholic tradition? Uh, is it where we have this autonomous reason, this prideful reduction of God to human categories, and so we tell God who he is and what he's going to be like by looking around at creation, and so therefore not understanding the transcendence, the freedom of God, but reducing him to what we can know? That's a form of from below that's a huge problem, and uh, that's kind of an idol factory. However, as we saw when we looked at Rahner, that's not what the Catholic tradition at least wants to do. It wants to do something more like this, namely where we recognize that the categories we have are God-given to us, that nature comes from God. 
and therefore it bears his imprint. And this is eminently scriptural too. And so it's difficult to see how Barth can deny this as severely as sometimes it sounds like he wants to. Moreover, you have the principle of the incarnation. God became a man. God saw fit to express himself as a human being. So the language of humanity and the language of creation more generally cannot be completely bankrupt. I mean, if it were, we wouldn't have any capacity to speak of God nor to understand him. If our very humanity has absolutely no purchase, what is the meaning of the incarnation? Did God speak to us or not? if the language he used was scripture and the person of Jesus Christ. So the, as if your understanding of, of from below is like this, where you don't have the God-given um, ontology and, and vocabulary of the human, and that is if you don't see man himself as nothing but a mirror, nothing but an image, himself a mystery, reflecting God and therefore not even some man, not even something he can reduce to his own categories. Uh, if you don't see that and you just see that man creating and telling God who he's going to be on his own terms, that you have a problem. But that's not what the Catholic tradition ever said in as much as it went from below. Now, the Catholic church also, and I think Balthazar is a great example of this, definitely has this from above attitude. And however, here's where Barth has his own problem. If you want to say it's from above and you want to deny and kind of annihilate the human and not recognize any contribution or, or, or any capacity to receive the revelation as human, then you have a huge problem. So we would say that revelation then comes like a nuclear bomb to us, that, that the only thing that's left after revelation is sort of like the mushroom cloud and the, and the massive hole in the earth where God revealed himself. Because there was no reception. If the human being cannot receive, understand, express what has been given, then what happened in this revelation from above? So I think that a too strong uh, interpretation of from above, which seems to be what someone like Karl Barth did, uh, is, is one that is, is untenable. Um, and I don't think it's what Balthazar wants, but hopefully now you can see both the pro, the con, or the advantage, disadvantage, uh, prize, or risk in both approaches, and the way in which to avoid what's dangerous in either approach. Once again, if you come from below, you better watch out that you're not reducing God to uh, human categories and making an idol, and that you're always recognizing that this way from below presupposes, in a sense, a way from above, as God shapes the very categories by which I speak about him. And then if you like the way from above, you better make sure that you don't lose the other side of the tension. Namely, you have to, there's that bell back in the school. This is a long one. Okay. Uh, if, you're, if you like the way from above, that you uh, recognize that um, you, you have to hold on to the other side of the tension, and namely that the human can receive what God wants to give. Okay. Uh, I th this is now, I think, the last slide I've got here before switching to another video on Balthazar. But this beginning with the word of God, therefore, is what Balthazar wants. So he's from above, but he's not from above in the Barthian way. But he is definitely from above, uh, as somebody who wants to begin with a movement that we submit to, the otherness of God. And not begin by reflecting, okay, in myself, my own spiritual life, what are the conditions for the possibility of my spiritual experience of God? You know, where I, I'm not going back on myself, but I am fundamentally taken out of myself by admiring something that is different than me and recognized as such. Uh, the only foundation for theology and apologetics, therefore, for Balthazar, is the word of God. And thus, in the beginning of Love is Credible, he criticizes two approaches to God. Uh, the first one is from nature or the cosmological reduction. Now, this is a very complicated argument. Balthazar distinguishes between the approach from below or the cosmological reduction or the way of going to God from nature that was done by the church fathers in the medievals. And ultimately, he proves of that. He distinguishes, however, between that approach from nature or from cosmology and the modern way. And he thinks that the modern way is has forgotten certain very important premises of the church fathers and the medieval theologians, which makes the modern approach indeed problematic. And similarly, there's also from man. So uh, here too, uh, Balthazar will make a distinction 
and uh, it's it's the it's the the approach from man that has the typically modern prejudice that uh, he finds uh, problematic. Uh, if you are curious to, he does not, uh, unless I'm mistaken, I, I, I looked for it, he doesn't mention Karl Rahner in this book at all. Uh, but I think pages 39 to 43 could easily be interpreted as his critique of Rahner. There he critiques Marshall and Blondel, two very important figures for Rahner, and he critiques the transcendental approach uh, to theology. So I think if you want to see them talking to each other, you can read Balthazar and Rahner in those pages. And the reason uh, for this, the reason that he rejects the from nature and from man and, and wants to begin with the word of God as other is that neither the world as a whole nor man in particular can provide the measure for what God wishes to say to man in Christ. And uh, I think a fine image for this is something like a cup of water. And that's this picture in the top right corner. If you take as your categories, you know, some philosophical ontology or some anthropology that you've constructed without beginning with a theology, then you're, you're making something that certainly might have some truth to it, but it is not going to give you the categories that can, that can hold or receive all that there is to know about God and man. And so it will be like a cup that contains something, but revelation comes that is just pouring, 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 and there's so much you're missing because you are only going at it with the, the categories that you have created and brought to Revelation rather than receiving from Revelation the very categories with which to understand it. So, uh, Balthazar says, there is no text that offers a foundation for God's text. There's no, you know, book you just have to read before reading the Bible, making it legible and intelligible, or perhaps we should say more legible and more intelligible. It must interpret itself. And this is what it wishes to do. The Bible doesn't come and say, oh, uh, to understand me, you've really got to go read this philosopher or understand this psychology or something. No, the Bible says, sit down and listen and let me tell you what I am. If it should do so, then there is one thing we can be sure from the outset. It will not consist in anything that man could have figured out about the world, about himself and about God on his own, whether a priori or a posteriori, whether easily or with difficulty whether it's something always already evident or as a notion that evolves through history. So begin with the word of God, begin with the otherness of God, the beauty of God as it comes to us in his word that strikes us and that purifies our hearts and gives us a new way of seeing such that we can understand on God's own terms, his mystery. Okay, I'll stop this video here and uh, I wish you the best of luck reading this very difficult but extremely stimulating book.